In today's video, I want to talk about a practice that's often overlooked. That is the practice of recollection, an early Buddhist practice of the Ten Recollections. So that's what we'll deal with coming right up. I'm Doug Smith of the Online Dharma Institute, that's onlinedharma.org. If you're new to this channel and interested in living a wiser and a kinder and a calmer life, consider subscribing to the channel and click the bell down below if you want to receive notifications when I come out with new videos. So this, is, this practice of recollection was actually one that was uh, d discussed by the Buddha on many occasions in the early texts, at least so far as we know from the evidence we have. But they're often overlooked. You might say that we don't remember them. We're, we're not really recollecting these early practices of recollection. Uh, and so I want to try to correct that today and bring it in front of us as something that we should indeed keep in mind and something that we might want to make part of our regular practice along with everything else. Uh, because I think it can be helpful. All of these practices can be helpful and these ten recollections uh, particularly so, let's say. So the, the Pali word for recollection is anusati, which is a sort of a compound word of anu, which essentially in this context means repeatedly or over and over, and sati, which some of us may know is the word for mindfulness. It's also the word for, for remembering memory. Uh, it's, I mean, the word for mindfulness does connote memory, remembering, it's actually the same word, uh, because to be mindful, well, there's a lot of de debate and dispute about exactly the relation between memory and mindfulness, but basically I think of it as that to be mindful means to keep in mind things that we have heard before about the way we're supposed to practice. In other words, we're, we're recollecting, ah, yes, 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 I'm supposed to sort of calm myself down, I'm supposed to follow the breath, I'm supposed to do this and this and this, that's at least the way we begin. And so recollection practices are closely related to mindfulness practices, if you like, and we're going to see some of that in these ten practices that we're going to get into. Now there are different lists that we'll find in the early texts of recollection practices, uh, different numbers of things in these lists, but I'm going to take um, in today's video what I believe is the longest list, which is a list of ten. Um, it's the most complete, if you like, and we'll go from there. So, so the Buddha says that these practices, these, these uh, practices of, of ten recollections, he says, uh, when developed and cultivated, it leads solely to disillusionment, to dispassion, cessation, peace, insight, awakening, and extinguishment. That is, these ten practices, these ten recollections, are really something that leads us directly towards awakening, which is a, a strong claim to make. Uh, I mean, he does say similar things about, let's say, the uh, foundations of mindfulness and so on, so it's not the only thing he says this about, but the point is that this is one of the key kinds of practices that, that we should keep in mind. Now, the first, we'll start, start with number one, the first thing that the Buddha says we should recollect is the Buddha himself. Now, there are many different ways we might go about this. Uh, in the text, it's generally, I think, suggested that we keep in mind the, the perfections of the Buddha. Now, we might say as, a, as an inspiration to us, as something to, to, to look towards or look forward to. Uh, I think also it may be helpful to keep in mind uh, what it would be like to be a sage like that, to be somebody who is awakened. It's a sort of a good recollective type of mental operation of, of what it would be like, what, what kind of person that would be. If we were to have the Buddha in front of us, what would they be like? How would they be acting in whatever situation we find ourselves? And that can be a good practice. Uh, of course, in the day of the Buddha, the, the practice that the Buddha is recommending here would be slightly different because, of course, he would have been speaking to people who actually had seen him and knew him personally. And so he would be saying, you know, remember me when you're, when you're off doing whatever, it else, whatever else it is, just keep me in mind. We can't do that because we've never seen the Buddha. So what we have to do, as I'm what I'm suggesting here is what we have to do is do a little bit of, uh, of fantasizing, let's say, of what it would be like to be in the presence of somebody like that. 
or perhaps we know somebody who is sort of a lesser sage, let's say. I mean, in other words, we don't, we haven't necessarily made contact with somebody. We, we don't know somebody who is awakened, but maybe we know somebody who is significantly farther along the path than we are, somebody who is wiser than we are. So we can keep that person in mind too. That's not the Buddha, it's not quite the same recollection, but at least gives us some inspiration along those lines. So now the Buddha says that this is a good way of of, of trying to see what it's like to uh, get out from under our ordinary tendencies towards greed and anger and delusion. In other words, to put ourselves in the mind of somebody who doesn't have these things anymore, who doesn't get angry, who isn't greedy, um, who isn't deluded about the world. Uh, simply by uh, trying to envision what it would be like to be such a person, we're helping to get ourselves to that end. The second recollection we should have is a recollection of the Dharma, which is our wise insight into the way the world is, the sorts of teachings that the Buddha gives us. And the Buddha describes the Dharma in this passage as visible in this very life, immediate, inviting one to come and see, relevant so that the wise can know it for themselves. That is, the Dharma isn't just theory, it isn't just a sort of a philosophical theory. I think many of us may come to Buddhism, uh, I certainly did myself, at least partly, come to Buddhism from a philosophical background, and from that kind of mindset we may think of the teachings of Buddhism as sort of theoretical constructs, which in, from one angle they are, but they aren't only that, and they aren't mostly that, let's say. So. It's not simply theory, it's rather something that we can see in our lives before us right now. And that's the importance of the Dharma. The importance of the Dharma is not to think of it as some kind of abstract, but to think of it uh, reflected in our daily life. Also, he says that it's, it's not something secret, it's something that we should come and see for ourselves. It's not a kind of an occult or secret teaching that is held behind closed doors that's uh, given out only to particular initiates. In early Buddhism, the Dharma is something that is open to all of us, that is seen and obvious in our lives, that is made clear to us when we open our eyes. That's the idea of the Dharma. Uh, if we are able to get ourselves into a position where we're calm enough and clear-eyed enough, we're going to see the Dharma. And when we think of the Dharma in this way, we come to see how it's immediately helpful and useful to our lives here and now. In other words, simply seeing that all things change, this becomes immediately useful to us because it shows us how it isn't useful to cling to things and expect them to last forever or to be a, a sort of a perfect refuge for us. Or that life is unsatisfactory in some deep sense. Uh, th that can help us to overcome our tendency to, to get angry with life or lament uh, the, the ordinary problems that befall all of us. The third recollection is the recollection of the Sangha. Now, what does the Buddha mean by the Sangha? Uh, and I've discussed Sangha on past videos, and sometimes I'll get comments from people that the Sangha means this and it doesn't mean that. What we find in the early texts is that the Buddha describes the Sangha in many different ways. He'll describe it in different ways in different places. So uh, it's a broad idea of what a Sangha might be. Uh, in this text, in the text that I'm discussing here, and I'll put a link to it down below, he describes the Sangha based on uh, the eight uh, people, eight particular individuals. Uh, that is to say, uh, people who have reached one of the four uh, typical stages uh, of, uh, of higher achievement, which are stream entry, uh, once-returner, non-returner, and arahant, or person who's awakened. And the other four are people who are on the way to those four achievements. Now, the, uh, what exactly these achievements mean, I've done an earlier video on that. I'll put a link to it down below. It's sort of outside the scope of this video, but the point is, that these are various achievements which have been or had been even in the Buddha's day. They were achieved by both monastics and by lay people. So the upshot is that in this particular 
recollection practice, the Sangha is quite broad. The Sangha means anybody who is practicing on the Buddhist path, who is practicing, uh, you know, even for stream entry, which is sort of the, the initial part of the Buddhist path, even if they haven't achieved stream entry yet. They're, they're still practicing, but they're, they're one of the eight, uh, up all the way to becoming an arahant or somebody who is awakened. So uh, in this context, uh, the Sangha, the recollection of the Sangha, is quite a broad recollection. It's a, a recollection of simply that there's a large group of people, lay people and monastics, who are all practicing for these uh, beneficial ends. And there's a refrain with all of these recollections that, that comes up again and again as he discusses each of these recollections we can go through. And that is the aim that we're trying to achieve here is to remain in balance among the unbalanced and to remain unafflicted among the afflicted. And the unbalanced has a connotation here also of being divisive, of, of making problems. And a lot of people in the world, most people really, are to some degree or another unbalanced. They're divisive. They are afflicted and afflicting of others. And so the, the point of these recollections, all ten of them, I'm just going to discuss this here, but we can remember this in the context of all ten, or keep in mind that it's there. The point is to become more at, at ease, more in balance with the way things are by making these recollections. In the context, let's say, of, of the Sangha, it's simply to keep in mind a balanced Sangha, a Sangha that is unafflicted, that is non-confrontational, that is not divisive. Now, the fourth recollection that we're supposed to do is to recollect our own virtuous behavior. Now, this is not in order to become puffed up and egotistical and think that we're better than others, in other words, to engage in the conceit of a comparing mind, which the Buddha believed was not uh, very skillful. So the point is not to compare ourselves to others, but simply to rejoice in whatever we've done well in our lives. And I think this practice is one that is particularly apt for many of us nowadays, not all, but many of us, because many of us uh, tend to be a very hypercritical, self-critical, uh, even may engage in self-hatred from time to time. This is something I've discussed on these videos. And uh, going through a practice, which again, the Buddha says this is a regular practice we should do, and it's a beneficial practice, keep in mind, to recollect our own virtuous behavior. Uh, to put ourselves in a mind of what have we done right? What things in life have gone right for us? What uh, problems have we been able to avoid that other people may have not been able to avoid? Again, not to, not to say that we're better than other people, not to, do, not to engage in comparisons in, in a sense of saying that we're better or worse or something, but simply to say that there is something we can rejoice in, that we can feel good about, that can give us a positive mindset to go forward, that can give us confidence, if you like, in our own path. Because we need confidence. I think confidence is a great thing to have. And if we're always engaging in in knocking ourselves down or in looking at the bad things that we've done, we're not going to have confidence. I think, to be perfectly fair myself, I think we should have a balance between these two kinds of, of views. Uh, certainly we need to keep in mind uh, our regrets or what we've done wrong, but what the Buddha says here, he doesn't have actually, he doesn't actually re recommend a, a recollection of our regrets. He only recommends a recollection of what's gone right. So really what the Buddha is saying is, he's actually disagreeing with what I actually had pre previously thought. He's actually saying we should be thinking of the good things in our past, the things that we've done right. The fifth recollection is a recollection of our own generosity. So this is similar to the last one. Just as we recollected our own virtuous deeds, here we're recollecting generosity, our ability to give things away to others, to help others with our own uh, with our own things that we already own and we can we can make that we can help use to help other people have better lives. And I think this is also a wonderful, wonderful practice because it again helps us to uh, well, it gives us a good base of confidence to proceed forward, but also it can reinforce in us 
the happiness that is involved in being generous. Uh, I think off too, all too often, uh, especially in nowadays in this sort of modern acquisitive world, we tend to think of happiness as related to acquisition. That is to say, we remember how happy we were when we acquired such and so. Even if it may not have made our lives perfect by any means. But it also, I think a great antidote to that kind of knee-jerk tendency is to remember how happy it makes us to be generous. How happy it makes us to see somebody else happy, let's say, or to have something done because of some generous act that we have been able to uh, kick off, that we've been able to do. And it's also a celebration, we might say, of our own ability to relax around greed and relax around avarice. And that's, after all, the aim of practice. And so if we can see this relax relaxation around these tendencies towards greed and avarice and this mind-making, well, we can see how we're progressing. The sixth recollection that the Buddha suggests is a recollection of the deities, the gods, the, Buddha, the, the gods that the Buddha saw in, in his pantheon. And this, this recollection may be, at least as stated, may be most useful to those of a traditional mindset uh, nowadays who accept the Buddhist pantheon of deities. Uh, that's fine. Uh, the Buddhist deities were, uh, as he understood them, mortal beings. This is very important. They were mortal beings, uh, but who had risen to a stage of great glory through having achieved great uh, karmic deeds. In other words, they had wonderful good karma on their sides through uh, many, many lifetimes of, of rebirth. Again, this is part of the traditional story. And since they had, had, had built up so much good karma over many lifetimes, they were eventually able to be reborn as a god in this kind of illustrious stage. But this was only going to be a temporary stage, and then eventually they would become mortal. I mean, that should, that they're always mortal, but they, eventually they would become humans or animals or something else. They would go through the cycle. And so the idea here, when the Buddha says that we should recollect the gods, what he's saying is that we should recollect the importance of good karma, the importance of doing good things, that doing good, good things, uh, uh, building up good karma, is to our own benefit. And to that end, I think, we can have a recollection like this uh, on a, uh, let's say, less traditional kind of way, but simply to understand that there are people in this life, in this world, who have done great things and, and achieved great ends because of it. We may recollect uh, virtuous uh, scientists, virtuous businessmen, uh, virtuous uh, uh, doctors and teachers and uh, lawyers and politicians, because there are virtuous people in all of these uh, fields, but people in all of these fields who, through hard work, diligence, uh, generosity, uh, again, virtuousness, have been able to achieve great ends, have become famous and, uh, and, gl and glorified and well-loved by the world. Uh, well, each of us will have our own individuals we'll think of in this context. If I give you mine, it may be different from yours. And then we would get into a question of who was right and who was wrong and who was really virtuous and who wasn't. That's not really the point. The point is simply to indulge ourselves in a recollection of the the good benefits of virtue in the world and and to to remember the point of it to make them sources these, these people that we recollect sources of inspiration for us even again even if we don't get to that end even if we don't ourselves become so glorified and illustrious in whatever field we happen to be in at least we can become inspired by their example, perhaps to do better ourselves, to see that there is a possibility to do well and to achieve good out of it, because we can use them as an example for us in our lives. Now, the next three recollections that the Buddha suggests are more directly forms of mindfulness practice. Again, we discussed at the beginning how uh, mindfulness and recollection are uh, allied kinds of ideas. Uh, they use the same term as part of what recollection is. So uh, these are, they're not huge differences here. But in any event, the seventh of these practices is mindfulness of breathing. 
and mindfulness of breathing is Wow, I mean, it's just the fundamental Buddhist practice in many ways. Um, it, it's one that we can think of as, and many of us may think of as, preliminary or kind of basic. But to be fair, uh, mindfulness of breathing is something that Buddha says he did throughout his life. It was really the fundamental, if you like, practice of, of Buddhist meditation. Uh, it's one that involves both calming and mindfulness practice within it because it helps calm us down and it brings our mind into a kind of focus. And it's always there for us. So no matter where we are, no matter what we're doing, uh, we can perhaps think and recollect that if we need it, we can always do even one cycle of mindfulness of breathing and that can help clarify our mind enough to do well in a particular circumstance. So mindfulness of breathing is a practice, a, a, a recollective practice that I think is very useful to keep in mind. That's the point, is to, to recollect that this practice exists and can be useful to us. The eighth practice uh, is one that will perhaps surprise us. That is mindfulness of death. And mindfulness of death may be a shock to some of us that that should be the sort of thing we should keep in mind. It may seem like a downer to many of us. I mean, why would we want to recollect or consistently recollect death? It just seems like, you know, boy, it's going to just get, get you depressed. But the point here is that mindfulness of death is a critical constitutive part of Buddhist practice. It's the kind of thing that I think brings our practice into focus because it makes us aware of the fact that all things pass away, including ourselves. That no matter how dear to us something is or someone is, that eventually uh, they will go out of our lives, either because we will die or because they will die. All things pass away. And that gives a certain energy and impetus to our practice this awareness that there is no other secure refuge in life because all things pass away, because death is a reality. And, and I think if we get away from that, if we uh, push death aside and don't recollect it and don't keep it in mind, I think our tendency all too often in practice can be one of uh, subtle or less subtle clinging to things, because Insofar as we forget about death, we can all too often cling, let's say, to ourself or to our mind or to things around us, people around us, because we haven't really comprehended the fact of death. So I think to make our practice deep, a, 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 a consistent recollection of death is going to be an important part of it. Uh, understanding, of course, that each of us is going to have our own the amount of depth that we'll be able to get to. I mean, of course, some of us are going to really only be on the surface here because it's going to be too difficult. But we can have compassion, self-compassion here, and just to, to be mindful about it to the extent that we can. The ninth recollection practice is, again, uh, once again, a mindfulness practice, or at least a recollection of mindfulness practice, which is mindfulness of the body. Now, mindfulness of the body is... Uh, actually a larger container that contains mindfulness of, of the breath within it uh, because the breath is part of the body's action. So this is a kind of repetition of what we saw before, but not entirely because mindfulness of the body is a larger context. It in fact also includes mindfulness of death too because mindfulness of death involves the death of the body. But mindfulness of the body can be also seen as a, an inspiration to us when it comes to right action, right speech, right action, right livelihood. All of these kind of ethical uh, aims for us involve the body in one, to one degree or another, using the body properly. Uh, using speech is, of course, a bodily operation, so that's right speech. Uh, right action is, of course, using the body itself. What, where is the body in space? How is it interacting with the world? Is it doing things that are that are helpful or that are not. And similarly, uh, we can even say uh, that 
Uh, right livelihood is another use of the body, a uh, uh, use of the body in various ways to uh, make a living for us. And so all of this uh, recollection of mindfulness of the body is, again, fundamental to our daily life, of keeping an eye and, and recollecting that mindfulness that this practice exists, that the, we have the practice of mindfulness of the body that we can use when we need to, and that it, it's useful to particular ends, to be aware of the way the body is, is, is being used. Are we sitting down? Are we standing up? How are we behaving? Extremely important. And the, the tenth of these recollections, the last one, is, is a recollection of peace. Now, peace, uh, we might say, is the final aim here. It's the aim of practice, is to become, to come to a stage of peace uh, with everything. Uh, peace with ourselves, peace, peace with the world, uh, peace with the Dharma, peace with the way things are. And this may also uh, take us back to the refrain that we discussed earlier, that we are to remain unafflicted among the afflicted. To remain, un, uh, to remain balanced among the unbalanced. And as, as we remember, that also has to do with uh, not getting into divisiveness and not getting into, uh, let's say, arguments and disputes. These are other uh, ideas which, although they aren't discussed precisely in this sutta, are discussed in other suttas in a similar kind of context. Um, so all of these are towards the aim of recalling I mean, that's this final recollection, recalling what the aim is that we're striving for, that we're aiming at. Uh, so for some of us, the word striving may be uh, too strong, but in any event, that's where we're going. That's where this path is leading us, is in this direction of peace. Uh, and throughout all of this, uh, I think we've seen the importance of recollecting uh, mindfulness practices, because uh, these all shade into each other. These ten recollections that I've just gone through are a form, a different way of understanding mindfulness. They're a little bit more deliberate, they're a little bit more conceptual, um, they're a little bit more uh, about thinking about certain things rather than simply say, seeing the way the world is. However, they shade into one another. There isn't a, a clear boundary between them. And so, I would recommend taking a look uh, and, and recollecting through that look, taking a look at the four foundations of mindfulness. And I've done a series of videos about that. I'll put a link up here on the screen to a playlist of those videos, which I think would be really helpful to go through. Thanks so much for, for paying attention, for recollecting these videos, and I hope we'll see you on a future one.